things that we always say uh, uh, about Abiding Life Ministries and just the teaching that we have is that you can't put it into anybody. You just can't do that. Our job is to witness to what God already put in you. And the reason you're here this morning isn't because you heard something different. It's because you heard what you always knew was right deep inside of your spirit and there was an explosion in there. We're only witnesses to things. And uh, I really had to suffer in, uh, in France through the mission conference there. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, because you know France is a very difficult place to work. But I was there as their key speaker, but I didn't get to speak for five days because every missionary got an hour and a half to give their PowerPoint presentation on the one gimmick that would change all of France. And uh, it was shocking. And I wanted to fall on my pencil that many times and just, <laughs> and just die right there and go, well, he's gone, he's gone. And, and one fellow had an incredible presentation where he, he showed us releasing 50,000 helium-filled balloons at the Eiffel Tower with the church phone number on it. And all these balloons are going up and everybody's ooing and aahing and all this. So at the break, I went over and I sat by him, uh, well, for lunch. I sat by him and I said, you know, brother, you didn't tell us the outcome of that 50,000 balloons. I said, it was spectacular seeing all that. And he said, well, I got 10 phone calls and they all asked me to leave the country. <laughs> well, that was the outcome of the program. And I think that's the outcome of every program. And when I finally had an opportunity to speak, I went around the room and I just asked the different missionaries, how did you come to the revelation of Christ? What happened to you? And do you know it was consistent? It never happened on a day they expected. And it came out of nowhere when it did happen. And it was just as though someone was telling them something they always knew deep within inside, but they were saying it with different words. And do you know that's what good counseling is? Is for you to say something to somebody that they always knew, only you said it in different words. And the witness outside and the witness inside brings an explosion in them. But do you know what? It also brings an explosion in us. And that makes it very, very addictive, really, to be able to see God bring an explosion. And once I came into this message of the very simple fact that whoever does all the work gets all the glory, and God does all the, gets all the glory, so he must be doing all the work, I started resting and letting him work. And uh, it's fun to see what God will do when you're resting. I had to have my throat checked before I came here, and Betty took me in and said it would take 15 minutes and I was in for an hour and a half. And she said, how could it take an hour and a half? Do you have cancer or something? I said, no. The, the nurse took my history, found out I was a counselor, and wanted to know if I could help with her abused niece. And so we talked about that, and I got done. And then the doctor came in and read that I was a counselor and wanted to know if I could help with her adopted Russian daughter. We got done with that. Then it was a, and it just went like that all day long. And I said, I've just I said, I've created so much business in there, and I only wanted my throat checked. <laughs> But what we're doing is we're witnessing to what is in somebody. And so that's what makes it beautiful that in religion, you have somebody that you exalt because they know more than you know and they know something that you don't know. We don't do that in the Christian faith. We all know the same thing and we're coming into a revelation of it day by day and moment by moment. And that's what we're here for this week is a confirmation of what is already in you. And so you know what's really nice is you're not going to leave here with any more than you came with. Not a thing more. A woman in Brazil was standing outside the conference and, and finally I, it was over and I said, are you lost? And she said, no, I'm not lost. I just don't want to leave this feeling. And I said, sister, you weren't listening because you brought it with you. So you can't leave it here. It goes with you because it's the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I enjoy these times together because people who have the revelation of Christ and Christ only rarely get to bunch up. There just aren't enough of us. And so if you have that, you're going to be spread out. And it's nice to be together with people that are like-minded and have a like teaching. I, uh, I had to laugh one time because Betty, for years, now she's doing her editing. She's editing this morning, finishing up a book uh, that we're working on there that I promise I'll put you to sleep if you get it. <laughs> but she used to work in the office and someone called the office and they were really taking me off and they didn't know they were talking to my wife. But they were really taking me off and I said this, said that, and Mike Wells is a cult and the whole thing's cultish and this and that. 
And finally she said, if it is a cult, it's a cult of one because I'm his wife and I don't agree with him. <laughs> and so one of the things we know <laughs> is that nobody has, has all the answers. And I really liked a fellow in, uh, in Africa because Africa, uh, as I work there a lot, and, and most of where I work now, the people can't read. But it's interesting how the peace of God can rule in someone's heart and how God does speak and his sheep do hear his voice. And this fellow just said that he wanted all the revelation that God could give him of Christ. All the revelation that any man could have, he wanted it. And he said God showed him a huge room and there were no walls to the room. It was that big. And each one had a gold chest with the name of a believer on it. And God spoke to him and said, you can have what's in your chest, but not what's in everybody else's. Because it takes every person in the body of Christ to express me. That's how big I am. And I really do believe that, that everybody's got a chest and everyone has something to offer. And, of course, that's why I enjoy doing history, because I get involved in people's lives and I, and I get to find out where they're at and what's going on in their lives. It makes it great fun. I have a lot of fun as I, as I travel, and, you know, uh, I talk about that because I do it quite a bit. From uh, last August until June, I was home 21 days out of, the, uh, out of that year. I was home a couple of months working uh, in the summer, our summer, and I'll be gone three and a half months. And I have great experiences with the people of God. It is true that God does give you mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and homes in this life that you never knew you had. And I was sharing that often I've had experiences that are unbelievably good, but I had one that was terrible. And those happen too. And some of them can leave deep wounds that take a long time to get over. And uh, I was in Costa Rica. They know that I like coffee there, so they took me to a coffee plantation. And I learned a lot about coffee. I mean, I mean, it's amazing all there is to know about coffee. And coffee, when it grows, you see all the berries are on one, on, uh, one branch. And the temptation would be just to take your hand and just strip them off there and put them in a bag. But if you do that and you don't pick them individually, the branch will reward you or the coffee plant by not giving you any fruit for five years. It wants you to gently take it away, not strip it off. You can't have it that easily. Anyway, I'm learning all this, and, and the old man that owns the coffee plantation noticed there's a foreigner there, and he came out, and he said, um, where are you from? And I said, United States. And he said, what state? And I said, Colorado. And he said, well, what is Colorado known for? And I said, well, Colorado is basically known for two things. I said, the most handsome men in the world come from Colorado, and the most intelligent men in the whole world come from Colorado. And he stood there for a while looking at me, and he kept staring and staring, and finally he says, I see there are exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a deep, deep wound, you know, for him to, him to, him to tell me that. That was terrible. Uh, we start every meeting just the same way. And uh, it's a very simple way to start a meeting, but I think it's important. And I start every meeting by just saying this, Jesus, you're welcome here. And Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And Father, you're welcome here. And we didn't come this far to hear a man. We came this far to hear you. And we didn't come this far to fill our heads either. We came this far for you to speak one word into our hearts. Because one word from you would be worth a thousand words from man in a thousand years. And so we just ask that you would speak to us just this one word. And we trust him to give us that, that one word as we move along this morning. And I want to lay a foundation. Some things I, I want to repeat because they need repeating. And I find that I need to re-indoctrinate myself all the time because the wrong thing has been said so long that the right thing begins to sound wrong. And so I have to keep reminding myself because I'll find myself saying things that just aren't true. And you've heard me say this often in, you know, to an audience, is how many people would like to be closer to Jesus in this room? And everyone that raises their hand, I say, keep your hand up because now I'm counting all the unbelievers. Because you can't get closer to him than having him dwell in you. And yet we're all the time thinking in, the, in those kind of terms. And a, a lady told me the other day, she said, God has left me. And I said, well, let God be true and every man a liar. Because if he's left you, He's left me too. 
because I'm not feeling anything special today. And if I'm not feeling anything special, maybe that's the normal way of being in him. And so I recognize that I'm in him. I'm not trying to create a feeling. The Indians tell a story about a, uh, a little fish and an old fish in the ocean. And the old fish asked the little fish, what do you want to do when you get older? And the little fish said, well, I want to see the big ocean. And the big fish said, well, you're in the big ocean. And the little fish looked around and said, this is it? <laughs> well, you know what I mean? I'm in him today. I am in him. This is it. This is what it's like. This is the normal Christian life right now, today. This is what it was like. It's what it's to be like to be in him. And so I, I, I repeat things because probably for myself more than, more than anyone else. But I'll tell you this that I've discovered, and, and you have too, and Paul discovered it, and that's the greatest struggle in the Christian life. And, of course, in the Christian religion, we're going to hear that the greatest struggle is against the flesh and against the world and, and uh, uh, against my mind and all of these kind of things and doing the thing I don't want to do. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.1, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his struggle. And that will always be our greatest struggle, to determine to know Christ among the people. And every day uh, you will hear, probably from a believer, that Christ isn't enough, that you need more. And we're told that all the time, that there's always more that we need. We need more and more and more. And so we run around trying to fill our bags with what we need, and what God's doing is running around cutting the bottom out of the bag so I have nothing. And then he's most creative with the person who doesn't know what to do. And that's one of the things that we look for as we're, as we're training counselors. Are you willing to take the leap and not know what to do in every situation? Or do you want the information that tells you exactly what to do in every situation? Because if you want that, the training will take 20 to 30 years it still won't be good training because there's no paper trail behind that training. And if any of those methods worked, everybody would be healed. Uh, the latest statistics in, in Australia, when you start looking at how many people suffer from depression and how many have uh, bipolar disorders and how many are manic depressive, all of those kind of things, you know, it's about three times the population. <laughs> so every one of you have at least three problems I know of, <laughs> according to the research that you're, you know, that you're not getting over. And if you want to under, <clears throat> understand all those, it'll take you forever. But if you can take the risk and walk in faith and say, Lord, you witness to what's going on and you give me the discernment that I need, and I jump into something, because here's a fact. If you'll jump into the middle of a problem with Christ, I can guarantee you will do a thousand times more than the most proficient, well-educated psychologist or psychiatrist that there is in the world. Because you brought Christ into the situation. You brought the one who has the owner's manual for man right into the middle of things. And so here's the nice thing this week. You don't have to get everything. And I don't want to get everything. I go, uh, I go into mental institutions visiting. And uh, uh, they'll often give me a stack, the file on the person that's been there for who knows how long. And I'll, they'll put it in the room and I'll say, can you just leave me here to go through the files? And then I push the files aside and I just pray and say, well, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know these people didn't know what they were doing or there wouldn't be this stack of paper. And so would you come? Would you just come and be my wisdom and my words and my insight? And that's really our goal here, to come to that place where we're confident in doing that and where we're comfortable in doing that. And so um, I'll, I'll repeat a few things, but I, I want it to be my goal to make Christ known and to teach Christ and him crucified, and, and I believe that it's really enough. And I believe if we have him, we have everything. They told me a story in Brazil, and you, you've probably heard it, but uh, supposedly it's a true story about a, a wealthy man who he and his son's hobby was to collect famous art. And so they collected the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs and all this. But World War II came, and he was sent off to war, and in war he was killed. And uh, the old man didn't really know what happened to him, but one day a soldier appeared at his door and he said, I don't know if you know this, but your son died saving my life. And he said, I know a lot about your son, and I knew that he liked collecting painting with you, paintings, and uh, I'm no painter, but I tried to paint him for you. 
And he said, I don't think I captured anything in the picture but his eyes. And the old man looked at it and he said, well, you caught that. You did get his eyes. And he thanked him for the painting and he, and he put it in a prominent place. Well, when the old man died, they had an estate auction and people came from all over to buy these expensive paintings. And he had stipulated the first painting to sell had to be the painting of the sun. And people complained and said, but we want the Van Goghs, we want the Rembrandts, we want those things. Why, why, why are we doing this? And they said, well, it's in the estate. It has to go first. So they started at $100,000, and it went all the way down to $3. Nobody wanted it. And finally, the caretaker, who knew the boy and grew up with the boy, said, well, I can afford $3, and I love the boy. And he said, I'll give, it, I'll give you $3. And so it went to him for $3. And when it was done, the auctioneer said, okay, the auction's over. And everyone started complaining, but what about the Van Goghs and what about all these other paintings? And they said, well, the old man stipulated in, in his will that during the estate auction, whoever bought the sun got everything else for free. Mm -hmm. And it's really true that when we buy the sun, everything else is ours for free. It all comes with him. And Christian growth isn't changing, but it's growing in the revelation of what I've always had. You know, it's not true that somebody chose to overcome alcoholism. What they chose as a believer was to walk in the victory that Christ gained for them 2,000 years ago. That was really the choice. And so our choices are always to walk in what he's already given us, and we're going to talk more and more about that. As we go along... And that's why I like what Jeff's, Jeff's approach, we have more dialogue, because I know what I'm saying, but I don't know what you're hearing. And your questioning will refine me. And if you've noticed uh, in your life, there's people you minister to, people that minister to you. There are people who you'll never minister to. And there's people that'll never minister to, uh, to you at all. And there's people that you minister with. But there's also this large group of people who refine you. And I know lots of times when I'm speaking and someone comes up to give me a rebuke, I receive them as coming from the Lord because God has permitted them to come to refine me, not, not to destroy me. Well, in an, in an amiable group, that's even more true because people are refining what you're saying and asking you questions about it. And um, I said the other day at a meeting in Melbourne, I was just talking uh, about a guy who was uh, a young guy and he took me out on his farm and he was weeping and uh, he said, look, I'm addicted to porno. I've been looking at it for three years. And I said, you've been looking at it for three years? And he said, yeah. And I said, how many hours a day? And he said, about four hours a day I watch porno. I said, well, what could people do in three years and four hours you haven't seen? You know, I mean, you're watching porno that long. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really addicted. I said, well, what do you think is going to happen? He said, I think God's going to, the other shoe's going to fall eventually. And I said, you know, brother, in the three years you've been watching porno, uh, I'm sitting here in your brand new truck. I just saw your wife drive up that you married in a Lexus with a beautiful child. you got a brand new farm and a brand new ranch. You even were able to buy an airplane. That's in the three years you've been watching porno. I said, what are those websites? <laughs> I said, I'm thinking about getting onto porno myself. I said, I can't, if this is what happens when you watch porno. And I said, maybe the real issue for you isn't pornography, but you don't understand the love of God. That you think human behavior can hinder the love of God, and it can't. And maybe he's been proving that to you, and maybe the day you see that God is love and that he loves you, regardless, the porno will drop off. Do you know that's exactly what happened? Well, I got done and the pastor said to me, I don't like that kind of teaching because that's license. And you're treating it, uh, you're treating it too lightly, this porno thing. And I said, brother, it's my fault for not clarifying. The man had a cocked gun under the seat. He was ready to end it all. Do you think he needed me condemning him? Do you think he, did he, if he's got a cocked gun under the seat and he's sitting there weeping and he's ready to check out, does he really need me to tell him that what he's doing is wrong? Now I said, I have had people come in who said, well, the best thing for my marriage is my wife and I to watch porno, and I tell them to get out, if that's really what they think. Because that'll do nothing but destroy things in the end. But, uh, so I know being questioned is, is a good thing, and 
we want to do that. I know what I'm saying, but I don't, I don't always know what's being heard. And I also know this, which is, is good, and you're reminded of it all the time. But if you're right about everything, you're wrong about everything. And you may not be wrong in what you're saying, but you're wrong in your attitude. And so you just can't be right about everything. And there's another principle that we work on, which is this, is that we are all spiritual equals. And I'll make that point later on and prove that point to you. But we are spiritual equals. There is, there is no hierarchy in this Christian life of somebody who has more than the other if, if we have Christ. And again, I'm just a witness to what is already in you. And to keep bringing out a simple truth, which is this, that I have Christ on this hand and I have problems here. And when problems are my focus, I can't see him. And do you know that one problem turns into five? It's terrible. Because when the problem becomes my focus, I begin to withdraw. I begin to get angry. I begin to uh, forsake God. I forsake my fellowship. I do all those kind of things. It increases. But when Christ is my focus, even though the problem is there, I'm not going to be overwhelmed by it. And all the problems that we have in life, and we're going to build on that this morning because we want to lay a good foundation in this. But when someone presents a problem to you, the first question is how does it drive them to Christ, not how do I fix the problem. And that's a very, very slippery road, and it's something that you have to get fixed into your mind over and over and over again because you get trapped. And the goal really is not problem resolution. The goal is Christ. I was in Mexico speaking to a group of missionaries, and one of the head missionaries came in at midnight, and he was one of the head guys, and he comes in, and the door bursts open, and he sits in a chair and puts his feet up on my bed, and he looks at me, and he goes, I'm a homosexual. What do you have for me? And he's angry. And I said, well, I've got a lot for you if you can agree to one thing with me, and if you can't agree to this one thing, we've got nothing to talk about. And he said, what's that? And I said, can you agree with me that I would rather be tempted in homosexuality and driven to Jesus than never be tempted in homosexuality? Will you buy that with me? I would rather be tempted in homosexuality and driven to Christ than never be tempted in it. And he said, well, I never thought about that. And I said, well, think about it, because it's midnight and I want to go to bed. <laughs> and, you, and you're in here with your feet on my bed. And if we're not going to talk, you need to go. And he thought for a long time, and he said, you know, it does drive me to him. And when I'm with him, it doesn't bother me. I'm not overwhelmed by it. I'm not carrying it. I'm not wearing it. There's a lift in my spirit. And I said, so you want me to deliver you from the thing that does all that for you? No, I'm not saying that God won't deliver him from it or that God didn't deliver him from it. But the thing is, my question in the back of my mind right away was, how does this drive you to Christ? And really, we want problem resolution, but how does my marriage drive me to Christ and how do my children drive me to Christ? How does my job drive me to Christ and how does the economy drive me to Christ? And one of the things we'll work on this week and, uh, and we'll work on it quite a bit is just asking the question, what glasses do you wear? And being able to shift glasses. Because the whole world is geared to make us wear man-aware glasses. And you know, all news is, is an assembly line of PAP that's to tell us to keep our mind on man, to stay man-aware. And so what's the economy doing? What's the parliament doing? What are they doing with the... Uh, with the deficit and how are they going to take that and what about the immigration problem and what about the world finances and what about this and what about that and what about this and all of it is just man aware, man aware, man aware, man aware. Then you go to church and have you been memorizing scripture? Have you witnessed to your neighbor? If your neighbor goes to hell and you haven't talked to him, you know God's going to want, want you to give account for that. It's going to be your fault. What have you been doing about that? What have you been doing for your children? You know, are you raising your children in the Lord? Are, they in the, are you following the right program? Money, are you following the right program for your money? Everything's just man aware, man aware, man aware. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? You know, one of the nicest things you can do, and I, I don't know how long it's been since you've done it. Uh, some of you have children, and now you have grandchildren. But man, to go to the hospital and hold a newborn baby, you just take your man aware glasses off and give them a throw. And you put on your God aware glasses 
and you hold that baby whose head fits in your hand and you look at those little fingernails and everything and their eyes and you just go, wow, there is a God. And just to be God aware and to start looking around and to say, no, I have a God. I am God aware. I'm wearing these God glasses that I see him and everything around, around me. And that's a big goal and a big leap for us to be able to leave here being able to see God in everything that, that is taking uh, place around us. And we know this too, which makes it even more exciting. People with problems are humble people because they're talking to you. And do you know God loves humility, so I always know he's going to break through with them. He's going to do something with them because they're humble enough to talk about their problems. But in these end times, you test me on this if God doesn't get rid of the great men. And they're not going to be around anymore, but it's going to be the lesser man that God works through. And the lesser man isn't a man who was created in a Bible school and uh, in a seminary and with great knowledge. The lesser man is the man who in the events of life, which we call natural, which are really supernatural, in those events of life, I discovered what I couldn't do that only he could do for me. And so he's been preparing us in his own seminary in marriages that don't work and in children that rebel and in finances and in sickness and in loss and in returning habits and in frustrations and in a world that works not uh, against him but actually is working for him. He prepares us to a place of weakness where I really do get up in the morning and I say, apart from him, I'm going to be able to do nothing. And in fact, he's enough. He's just enough. I have him. Uh, one of the things that's, that's interesting is if you, um, and some of you know this if you travel, and it must speak about Americans, but you go in another country and you step out of the hotel, and the first thing that happens, you got some woman who the only word she knows in English is sex. Sex, sex, not sex, sex. Well, I don't even know you. Sex, sex. And some of them, they're so bold, that they'll try to get their hands in your pocket to get your money. And I had my father with me. I mean, he's nearly 80 years old and all bent over, and this woman's trying to get her money, his money out of his pocket. Sex, sex. He, he said, I don't think I'm ready for that. You know? he, he, he said, it'd be like an earthquake. If I survived it, the aftershock would kill me. You know? and, he, and so he, but she, she said, sex, sex, sex. And, and I just go, man, could you leave us alone, you know? And... Uh, but you know what? I see that same attitude in the church where people are going, Jesus, come, Jesus, come, come. We want you, Jesus. Come, come. We're ready for you, Jesus. Come. And I was speaking at a conference in Europe where, where the guy actually stood on the stage, the big man, the big name, and I'm standing next to him over here. I'm a nobody, but he's the big guy. And he starts shouting out, Jesus, get down here. We're ready for you. You get down here right now. Get down here. I'm ready for you, Jesus. I'm ready. Get down here. Get down here. And I'm standing next to him, so I'm doing this as he's talking. <laughs> and I'm just move, and I'm moving over like that. And, and there's a thousand people there in the audience, you know. And I'm just moving over and moving over and moving over. And, and I finally got a long while. I was clear at the edge of the thing while he was shouting at Jesus. And Betty goes, what in the world were you doing? You look like you did some kind of Michael Jackson moonwalk. Just getting away from the, just backing out of the thing. And I said... I was convinced that God was going to strike the man dead any minute. He would just strike him dead, and I didn't want to be there. Get down here. Get down here. I'm ready for you, Jesus. I'm ready for you. I want you. I want. What can you give me? You give me. You give me. You give me. You give me. And you know what? Men love to be wooed, and so does God love to be wooed. And it's really something if you lay in bed at night and you just say this to the Lord, I saw some great marriages today. I saw some wonderful kids today. I saw people driving nice cars, going to nice homes that have nice jobs. I saw handsome people today, and I saw beautiful people today. And do you know what, Jesus, out of all of that, I really just want you. I'm just happy with you. With you right now, just with you. Do you know that woos him and he loves that? And that's much more appealing to him than come, Jesus, get down here right now. Come and help me right now. Do this for me and do that for me. And and take care of me. It's, it's much more to him as we just woo him. But he's been preparing us 
to be able to handle what we can't do on our own. And he's been doing it in our weakness and revealing what weakness is to us. So everything you thought was taking you out is actually bringing you in. And everything you thought would take you down is actually going to bring you up because power is perfected in weakness. And I hope uh, that when I see you again, you're weaker Christians then than you are today and that you'll pray to be a weaker and a weaker believer. And we lay in bed at night and Satan whispers to us everything that's wrong with us. And all he's doing is whispering our qualifications for productivity and what's coming ahead. Because what I can't do, he can come and he can do that for me. A fellow was uh, in my office, a uh, young guy, and he just said that he was going to commit suicide. And uh, Betty said to me one day, she said, don't you find it kind of odd that you grew up suicidal, but now you're just creating it? Because <laughs> I have so many suicidal people coming. One of my hobbies is I collect suicide notes. And so I got a little stack, <coughs> a stack of those that I read that people have left with me. They're going to commit suicide. And I just look for good ideas. <laughs> and uh, so this fellow comes in, and he's, he's a zero. He's a zero to everything. I'm always writing at my whiteboard. And, but basically, you know, I said, what do you zero at? And he said, you know, I'm a zero as a neighbor and a friend and a citizen, a Christian, a parent, a job, a marriage, a son. I'm a zero as a man. I'm just one big zero. And I said, well, praise the Lord that you're a zero. I'm really happy that you're a zero. Because we know this, that God does more with less and much with very little and everything with nothing. And a zero is the easiest thing to fix. Everything else is difficult except a zero. Because all you have to do to fix a zero is add one to the zero. And then all of a sudden you change the value. And it doesn't do any good to add the one back here. It has to be added up here and we know what the zero is. When we add Christ to our zeros because he wants to be everything for us that we're not, uh, all of a sudden we have a huge value and he has a place that he can really work. And in religion, we're taught that God wants the most out of a man. But really what God wants in the Christian faith is the least out of a person. And so as he's emptying us out and bringing us to the point of zero, we ought to be taught that that is the way. And uh, that's where we're reprogramming all the time. I uh, was surprised at a church in the Amazon recently. It's a big church, but I just said, how many people here have been a Christian for a year? at least a year. And people raised their hands and I said, now who's been a Christian here the longest? And there was some old guy back there that you need to carbon date. I don't know how old <laughs> he was, but he, he'd been a Christian for 70 years. So I said, okay, we got one year to 70 years. Now, everybody who's been a Christian in between the one year and the 70 years, raise your hand. And so everyone raised their hand because it was a church. And I said, now, I want you to raise your hand again if between the one year and the 70 that you've been a believer, there's been a nagging problem in your life that hasn't left. And you've sought God over it and you've asked God over it and God has not taken away that problem from the first year to the seventh year. Now he's taken away a lot of other things but he hadn't taken away that. So if everybody here that still has a problem that God hasn't taken away after seeking him, reading, praying, going to the programs, would you raise your hand? Do you know everyone there raised their hand? Would you raise yours? Well, what I said was, when everybody had their hand up, is look around because that is the normal Christian life. So whatever you've been told is not the normal Christian life. This becoming a little Jesus and walking around and making that your goal and reaching this level of perfection isn't real. It wasn't even real for Paul. Because Paul still had a thorn in the flesh. In Romans 7, he still talks about his struggles that he had. And we know that he wasn't perfect. He just wasn't interested in talking about himself. He's interested in talking about Christ. So we don't know the problems and the hiccups that he had. But do you know what? You only learn in your failures. You don't learn in victory. What do you learn in victory? Uh, you learn more in the failure. But that is the normal Christian life. And so God has put something in your life that you can't control. And it's made you a zero in it. But have you discovered from that one year to the 70 years this simple truth? My grace is sufficient for you. Have you discovered that? 
that it is sufficient for you in the midst of that problem? And has the other shoe ever dropped and has he ever just wiped you out and has he ever said that's enough of you? And we'll see later on why he just wouldn't do that. But in this school and in this world, he's emptying me out so I can do things that I never imagined I was able to do. I like this fellow who, uh, of course, he'd finished university and he was about 30 and wasn't married. And uh, he came in and he said, I just want to end it all. I'm not going to live my life existing. And I said, well, brother, I know what, what you mean by that because life for you is existing. You ever felt like that where one day just went into the next day, into the next day, into the next day? And you live 23 hours and 30 minutes in insignificance, and you have 30 minutes you hope for of something significant happening. And he said, that's my life. And I said, yeah, you looked for life in this doorway called relationships. And so you thought a relationship would make you happy. But you found out that women were smarter than you thought you, they were because none of them would date you. And so you went along here and you couldn't find one. And then all of a sudden you found a woman uh, uh, that decided that she did like you because she wasn't that bright. And she <laughs> went along with you and she dated you and you thought it looked like marriage and the next thing you know she's dating your best friend. And then you tried to find another girlfriend you went back and forth. And one day you see yourself finally getting married right about here and then the whole thing will fall apart like other marriages that you've seen. And at age 85, you're going to be sitting in a wheelchair, sucking yogurt out of a straw with no teeth, <laughs> all alone, saying, what was it worth? And he said, that's it. That's exactly it. He said, you're reading my mind. I said, well, then you went over here and you looked for life and vocation. And you went to university and you had high expectations, but you couldn't find a job. And so then you went a long time in unemployment, and then you found these little jobs that really didn't fit your qualifications. Then you found a good one, you thought you'd stay there. Age 50, they found someone at 30 they could hire for a third the price. And now you can't, you're hoping you get the job pushing the carts at Walmart, but they found someone better. And at age 85, you have no financial security, you're sitting in your wheelchair, sucking yogurt out of a straw and no teeth, saying, what's it worth? He said, yep. I said, then you looked for it in a relationship with God. You couldn't find God, then you had an experience with God. It was a mountaintop. You thought it'd last forever, and then it went to the bottom. Then you had a series of failures. You felt rejected by God, and you're not even sure to this day that he accepts you. And so you're going to die at age 85 not knowing if God accepts you or not. And you'll just be looking at your watch saying, how come they haven't changed my nappy yet? It's time to change my nappy, and they haven't. And, and so then the guy makes me an offer, which this was a great offer. By my house is the highest su suspension bridge in the world. And he said, listen, let's both go to that bridge today and we'll hold hands and jump off together. That was his offer. He <laughs> said, I'm not jumping off a bridge with you holding hands. And, and he said, why? Why aren't you going to do that? He said, you've had the same experiences. What has kept you going? through all of that and through those tunnels and through that darkness. He goes, what keeps you going? If you've had all that happen, and I said, oh, mate, I've had it all happen. I've had good times and I've had bad times in my marriage, and then I've had times that weren't so bad, and I've had good jobs and bad jobs, and I've had times with God where I thought I'd never come off the mountain, and then times where I never thought I'd come off the pit. And I said, I've had all that happen. And he said, well, why haven't you killed yourself? And I said, because of revelation. One day I was looking at all of that and God did something amazing for me. As I was staring at it going, what in the world is the purpose of this life? All of a sudden, God did this. And he showed me that all he was doing was cutting a key that opened the door to my heart for the revelation of Christ in me, the hope of glory. See, we don't like being cut, and some of you are being cut today. And in my office, I often give people a blank key, and I say, put this on your key ring, and someday you'll try to open the key door or the door to the house with it, or you'll try to open the car with it, and I want you to stare at it and go, a key that's not cut is useless. And you need to be cut, and we don't want to be cut. But without being cut, you're useless. And do you know what? He's not done making keys for us. There's other doors to go through. 
there's more revelation of Christ. There's more and more and more as he cuts me in this world. And the thing is, this world is the perfect place for the cutting to take place, and this body of flesh is the perfect place. Do you know that when I look at Australia on a map, <clears throat> and I have a map that I've had for 25 years of Australia, it hangs in, my, in, in the office when you step into the waiting room, you see it. You've seen the map, but it's all framed and it <clears throat> it's nicely done. And it's Australia upside down, and it says Australia no longer down under. You've seen the, the map, you know, and so it's on the top of the world. But, you know, I look at that map, and I see it every time I walk in the office. And Australia is never a blob on a, on a world map to me, but it's people. I mean, as a kid, I always wanted to come to Australia, and Australia and their wisdom never allowed me. <laughs> but I did want to come here. I tried to come here when I was 17 and 18. And, uh, but anyway, I look at it now and I see faces and I see people and I see those that have hurt, hurt and those that have come through and people that have loved me and taken care of me and done things with me. It means a lot to me to look at that. Do You know, one day I'm going to be in heaven and I'm going to look down at, the, at this fallen world and this fallen flesh and I'm going to have such a deep, deep fondness for it because this is the world and this is the flesh that I came to know Christ in. And I, I don't hate it because I'm going to show you and as we go along that this world is not an accident, that a fallen world was all in God's plan and it's the only place for the key to get cut and it's the only place for me to find out who he really is and to have the revelation of him. You know, people read this passage in Revelations 21, uh, verse 3, and uh, they, they read it to encourage you when everything's going bad. And you know the passage? In heaven, there'll be no more mourning or crying or pain. And so just hang in there, brother, because heaven's coming, and there won't be any mourning or crying or pain. And do you know that that verse is one of the most depressing verses for me in the whole Bible? And I just really don't like reading it. Because you know what? In my mourning, I discovered the God of all comfort. Man, do you know that you know things that angels long to look into and they haven't been able to look into to see them? And that I would have never discovered those things in heaven? And that you're a very, very unique creature because you are half flesh and half spirit? And you can lean too far into the flesh, but if you lean way over here into the body and into the flesh, you hear the traffic of the world, but if you lean in your spirit, that traffic's just as loud, isn't it? And this was the perfect place for me to come to know him. We'll talk about that more. But for him, me to come to know who he is in this body. In my mourning, I found the God of all comfort. Do you know that in my crying, he didn't just look over the pit and say, my, that's pathetic. He came down in the pit. He picked me up when I thought I couldn't be picked up one more time. He wiped the tears off my face. He carried me out of the pit. He set me on my feet again and said, go. And I can't believe it to this day that he said, go. I discovered things about him no angel knows. They long to look into that. And that many times in my pain, I've asked God if he would heal me. And if you don't heal me, could you just please kill me? Then I would feel better. And I've been in places where I'm just so sick. And I say, Lord, and I've seen healings. And I go, would you please heal me? You know, he's very consistent in what he says to me. No. <laughs> I'm not going to heal you, but I'm going to carry you. And do you know what? No matter how sick I get, no matter what happens, I know I'm going to be at the meeting sharing because he's going to carry me. I've learned that he carries me. I've learned that he's there for me in the very darkest of my times that he's there for me when I'm alone. And here's a funny thing my father said to me. You know, after your mother died, I, I, I've just felt so lonely. And I said, I said, Dad, are you only now realizing that you're lonely? We were born lonely. Because there's a place in my spirit and in my heart that only Christ can come and no other person. And it's lonely until he's there. And you can, you can, you can lay in bed next to your mate and you're lonely. You know that. You can be in a room full of people and you're lonely because if he's not in that place that's reserved for him, you're going to be very, very lonely. 
and in my loneliness, I found him. I know that when Jesus got back to heaven after being a man, he had to look at God as a man, and we know he's the scarred man for eternity. He'll wear those scars. He's the slain lamb in heaven. He'll always have those scars. Uh, Sunder Singh, who said he was caught up into heaven, said that he saw Jesus and he was scarred, but the scars were so beautiful. But I know that Jesus still looks at the Father and goes, wow. Man, everything you were for, for me and when I was a man, wow. And so God is working in this world perfectly in your lives. And you know, I don't want to waste my time because you have 70 to 80 years, maybe 90, maybe less, and you will never have this journey again. You will never have tears again. You will never have mourning again. You will, ne you will never have pain again. And you will never, ever have the opportunity to know what God can be to you in that again. This is it. This is my one chance to learn the things of God angels don't know, and I don't want to waste it. I want to embrace it, and I, and, uh, and I want to enjoy it. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says this, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earth and vessel so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. And here's the beautiful thing. And here's what he discovered about God. We're afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life works in you. Isn't that nice? Some of you remember me telling you the story of traveling through West Africa and I couldn't find a guide uh, and there were no trails or maps. The interesting thing is in the local language, the word for guide is the way. So your guide is the way. And uh, so I'm looking for a guide to get to this village and they find me one and a fellow comes up to me and he sticks out his hand and he says, hello, I'm still alive. Well, this is Africa, so I said, right, I'm still alive. And he said, no, I'm still alive. And I said, right, I'm <laughs> still alive too. And he goes, no, my name is still alive. And I said, I don't want a guide named I'm still alive. I want a guide named I've never been hurt. I want a guide named I've never lost a missionary. I don't want a guide named still alive. I said, why did they call you still alive? And he undid his shirt with a big smile, and he opened it, and across his chest was the mark of a lion. And it had cut into the bone. And it was big, big puffy scars that he kept clean. He was very proud of them. And he said, do you know I met a lion, and I conquered the lion? And he said, let me tell you something. You're safer with me than anyone in Africa. Because once I conquered the lion, they named me still alive. So you come, there's no danger when you're with me. And do you know today, I'll walk through this life and I'll be alive because I'm alive in the one who is still alive. Touch my hands and touch my side and see that it's me. And he walks with me, the one who is still alive, who made this journey, who's taking me through it, who has a vested interest that we'll look at a real vested interest that I am able to make it. Yeah.